All right, so we're going to start. And to begin with, we know that we have an easy task here because everybody has already done the work. The presentations have been amazing. And um, the, if anything, they've made us feel really incredibly humble and, and just overwhelmed with what people have said about the clinic and the work of the clinic and Debbie and all of us. And we're just, we, we're so pleased about it and we're so thankful. And we're so thankful that people found the time to come and be here with us and to celebrate with us. Before, there's, there's gonna be two parts to this closing. One is that Nancy and I are gonna try to add, sprinkle the history of the clinic with some additional information and facts and maybe some clarifications, right? <laughs> and then we're going to um, close by, you know, just thanking different people who've been very much involved in, in coming here, et cetera. So let's start with, um, with the questions. You had something you wanted to put on, straight in the record, right? <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to state for the record that the criminal case that Rosemary so complained about <laughs> in her presentation, the man received a green card. Um, it, in spite of the armed robbery conviction. Um, let, let me start by saying it's the only immigration case she did, right? So, but it was a good one. And he was from Ireland. <laughs> and he, was, he was an Irish immigrant. He wasn't he, from South America or Black He was Welsh. He was Welsh. Welsh. Let's, be, Welsh. let's be clear. He was Welsh. As long as we're setting the record straight. He got his green card, and his first child's middle name is Nancy. So, <laughs> so <laughs> just to set the record straight so you don't think we bring bad cases. Um, the other thing I want to do is I just want to say everybody has had such wonderful things to say about the clinic that now is your opportunity, if the clinic has ruined your life in any way, uh, <laughs> now's your chance. So <laughs> speak now or forever hold your peace. Oh, there she goes. <laughs> I think the microphones do not work, so. <laughs> right, we made sure. Okay, so I'd like to start a little bit with, with the Haitian work that we've done. Um, Ira and talked about Debbie and Ira's work on the, on the, on the Haitian cases in the early, in the late, 1980s or early 1990s, and because of that wonderful work in reality, and I mean it seriously, in reality a number of, of people who had fled Haiti uh, by boat, etc., who were stuck in Guantanamo for some time, ended up coming to Boston. And so through our clinic, we've end, we ended up representing a large number of Haitians who had come through that whole experience. And in the very beginning, it was one of these deals where it was clear, as, you know, for people who did this work at the time, that it was very, very hard for Haitians to get anything in this country. And they were actually often very badly treated, probably worse than most people. But through the work that we did as a community, as a whole community in Florida and here, and through the work of our clinic and a number of students who work with us, we were able to represent these individuals and they went forward actually affirmatively, if I remember right, right? And most of them, in fact, I think everybody got status. And now if you go around, you end up meeting the kids of these families. And a number of these kids are doing really, really well. In fact, there's a large number who have uh, trained and now become pharmacists. So there, it's, it's an amazing, you know, groups of teachers, kids. The, um, the Haitian community in Boston is in great part a middle class community. And these families who came in, who were, came from some of the poorest parts of Port-au-Prince, have done so well and have moved forward with their lives. So thank you, Ira. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you, everybody, for that incredible work. Uh, Debbie, sorry. <laughs> okay, we're going to do a kind of George and Gracie thing here. Um, but um, I would like to say just a few words about the gender work. And um, like virtually everything in immigration, it's really a community effort. And in the gender work that the clinic did, there were uh, people all around the country working on those issues together. Pamela, we, you were central in, in that work. but. Um, but it was a, a huge community effort. Um, it was informed in great part by the Haitian work, by the fact that we had so many Haitians coming in and we had women and we were hearing stories. And um, this is, um, it, it was said earlier today that the law is not ready, that in some ways the law at various times is not ready. And that was really the question with the gender work. The law was not ready. And so it was really a question of getting people to slow down and listen to the stories. 
And one of the things that we really try to do with our work, and one of the things that we hope has come across, is that we really try to do the lawyering from the ground up. And we try to, to make the client the center of it, make their story and make their, their life um, and what is important to them the center of the story. Well, one of the stories that informed the gender work were the Haitian women. And one of the things that moved this case or this issue forward, there was the gender guidelines. There was a Haitian case of a woman um, who had been raped um, during the coup. And that case had been issued and it was issued uh, and made non-published, so it was not a binding precedent decision of the Board of Immigration Appeals. It was the only Board of Immigration Appeals case that was out there that actually addressed the question of rape at the time. And there was a massive effort that was launched to try to get that case designated as precedent. At the same time, as I said, people were hearing these stories. And what the community began to do was to collect the stories. And it led to us going to Haiti and collecting more stories and really putting together about 150 cases of political rape in Haiti and taking those cases to the Inter-American Commission and asking the Inter-American Commission for a finding that rape in that context is torture. We got that finding. We got the precedent decision. We got them within a couple of months of each other. And then we were able to come back to our individual cases with those findings and to move the law forward in that way. So, so um, from that work, and, uh, and the, a great part of that work involved also working with people in Canada on these issues, on gender issues, right? And from that work, we ended up doing a lot of work involving kids. And so as a result of that work, and we represented kids from Africa, from different parts, a lot of unaccompanied minors, before people were really thinking about, I mean, I, people represented unaccompanied minors around the country, but it wasn't like the issue on the table. And so we were learning how to do those cases. We were learning how to figure out how to, you know, kids are traumatized, how do you deal with them? Where do you get the information from if it isn't from the kids and all these issues. And from that work with a, 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 a sort of uh, coalitions around the country, we work with I, uh, ICE ended up putting out uh, guidelines for kids as well, and they were issued on Human Rights Day in 1998, if I'm right. So it's part of work that was done by a lot of different people, a lot of different organizations, some people here and our office as well. We were also involved later on with the asylum office in doing some trainings on these issues, and to this day we're representing a large number of kids, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um. Okay, at the risk of going through 30 years and saying then, um, we're going to sort of move forward to work that is uh, somewhat more recent, started seven years ago, um, uh, but what is still part of um, what we are really dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and what so many of our uh, recent grads and our current students have been spending their time doing. Um, but these cases grew out of a massive factory raid in New Bedford. Um, in 2007, in March of 2007. Um, and I know a lot of people here know about that raid. It was one of the first raids in uh, a, a policy, <coughs> excuse me, a policy uh, where immigration was conducting these massive raids around the country. Um, the clinic jumped in along with a number of legal services offices and um, nonprofits. We jumped in to try to do something when these people were sort of swept up. Um, it's not sort of, they were, they were swept up and taken to a military base and then within um, a day or two they started shipping them out of the state down to the Texas border where they were having um, hearings um, in uh, immigration courts located within the detention facilities. The whole idea was to get them down to the border, get removal orders in as fast as you can and get them out of the country. So. Um, we were involved in bringing a federal suit to try to stop that. Um, unfortunately, we were not successful in that federal suit. Um, but what we were successful in was getting those people out of detention through this massive effort. And it really, you know, looking around this room today and hearing what people have to say, it really strikes me just how important our network is, our community is, and how um, this community that does this work is a real force when sort of called to action. 
And um, we, when that raid happened, had to find these people in Texas. And we started making phone calls to everybody we knew who had anybody down at the border, knew anybody down at the border, anything we could do to get people down at the border, to go in, to talk to people, to get them to sign um, uh, um, retainers to let us act on their behalf and to try to you know, get bond hearings going. And um, anyway, at the end of the day, we found inside of, I think it was three days, the judge gave us from, I think it was Friday afternoon to Tuesday to get plaintiffs because we didn't have any plaintiffs because they took them all away. So um, he gave us till Tuesday and by Tuesday we had 179 retainers signed by people who we called who ran in and got, found them basically. Um, anyway, one of the first things that I learned as an immigration attorney is that your best, um, your best legal uh, research tool is a telephone. And that has really proven true because so many people are so generous with their, their knowledge and their time. Um, in any case, um, we managed to get through, through the efforts of individuals down at the border, through a very, very generous donor who started paying uh, bonds for people when we could get bonds set. We got a large number of those people out. And since that time, case by case, we have been doing those individual asylum cases. And John's going to talk a little bit about the work that's grown out of that. Just one quick thing. Um, one person who was here earlier and I think left is Harvey Kaplan, and we really drew on him at the time. He was just such an incredible resource in terms of d dealing with the, the, the case in federal court and fighting these cases sort of generally. Um, so as a result of, okay, so one thing that happened is when we, went, when we first went to federal court, what the judge, it was Judge Stearns, basically says, what are you doing here? I mean, these people really don't have any, any relief, do they? And so, well, we had to figure it out. So as of today, uh, of the 200, just under 200 people who got out, uh, we've, I think in our office, we've, there's been something like 36 cases, asylum cases have been granted. Uh, there's a number of U visa cases that are on the table, probably another 15 based on the um, on certifications from the Labor Department. And there's a number of, uh, a couple of SIJ cases, and hopefully down the line there'll be a bunch of suspension cases and there'll be more asylum cases. So at the end of the day, I think a lot of these families are saved. And at the very end, even if they've been ordered removed and there's an order of supervision, because most of these people have children who are actually DACA eligible or US citizen children, the government has in fact, uh, has in fact not deported them, which I think I really appreciate because it's been a big struggle, but the truth is they understand, I think the harm that these families are gonna, uh, are gonna suffer if they're made to return. And so I think that whole battle is ongoing and so much of it has to do with the, the students who work with us, the energy that came from us, uh, from this, the help of, legal, of Greater Boston Legal Services and Debbie and the clinic, and it just, it's just been a wonderful thing. Um, and going back to that theme of the law not being ready, okay? Um, when those cases started, the law wasn't ready. Um, we had not done um, Guatemalan asylum cases in, you know, everybody thought those Guatemalan asylum cases ended in the early 90s. And so it was really a question of teaching ourselves, of our students teaching us, of our clients teaching us most importantly, and of us all, you know, sitting down and trying to figure this out together. And really what we learned is, is kind of breathtaking um, about the circumstances of, of people, of indigenous people in Guatemala, of what they had been through as children, what that means to their lives, and um, what they continue to go through. But little by little, I think that the environment has changed for those cases, so that, um, as John said, a number of them are, have been granted. Um, we have some interesting cases at the First Circuit now, which um, one in particular which deals with uh, the question of the Gu um, Guatemalan genocide. And um, we're waiting for a decision on that case, so we'll see. Now, the other thing that came out of it, particularly for women from El Salvador and Honduras, and, and also some of the indigenous women, are independent women's claims. These are a lot of women whose lives, you know, their, their communities were turned upside down. Uh, a lot of men in their communities were forced out. So a number of the men, a lot of men in their communities who stayed were taught to, to you know, to kill and, and to harm women during the wars. And so these women stayed after everybody left. They're the ones who were there. They're the ones who are keeping the community going. And they get targeted as, as single women, and particularly as women who realize that they 
they had to move on. They had to provide for their family. They had to work. They had to deal with things because the old social structures had fallen apart. So they get targeted as independent women. And so a lot of the cases that we've won from Honduras and El Salvador, but also cases that we're seeing now, we will talk about it in a second, but the people who are coming up, a lot of them are independent women who are being targeted because they're, they're independent women and they don't, they, as they say, they don't have a man to, a man to protect them, uh, their father, their husband, et cetera. So they're very vulnerable and they're out there changing, going against the norms and cultures of their societies because they're standing up. So these are the cases that are there. So going forward, <laughs> the next 30 years, um, you know, what, what's on the table now? Well, obviously, you know, the cases we're working on, um, but we're, as everybody knows, we're facing a border crisis right now, right? Our asylum system is stalled, right? We, we can't get cases heard, and it's certainly not the fault of the asylum office, Ethan, wherever you are. Um, or, the, or the courts. Uh, or the courts. <laughs> um, it's just that people um, have got to leave, and, um, and they're coming. And um, so we're, we are facing a crisis um, regarding how we're going to deal with those cases, how we as a community are going to be able to serve them um, and to try to, to give them uh, representation. Um, a large number of those people are children, as we know. Um, uh, we're expecting um, that a lot more, well, we know huge numbers of unaccompanied minors are now coming in and the numbers are expected to grow next year. Um, we're expecting that it, a lot of them will be in Boston and we're trying to um, obviously find a way to deal with them. Um, and again, it's a community effort. Um, but again, it's a question of is the law ready? Um, because a lot of these children are going to be seeking asylum. A lot of them cannot go back. A lot of them will die if they go back. And how are we going to meet that challenge? How are we going to find a way to be able to um, get those children the protection that they need. So the only thing I would add is a lot of these kids and a lot of the women are, are actually fleeing violence by the gangs. And so some of them are gang members who, fled, who are actually defected, but a lot of them are actually conscientious objectors who refuse to fight with the gangs because either their families won't let them or they decide, they realize it goes against everything they believe in. So these are the cases that are really on the table. So we're really now really thinking through, we've done gang cases, they've been granted by the asylum office. Uh, we're pushing these cases forward, but the truth is this is where the law is, this is where the fights are right now. And so we are really pushing this notion, right now we're trying to think through this notion of of political opinion as it relates to these cases. And I think one thing about Debbie's book, Debbie just came out with a new version of her book and she addresses some of these issues because this is on the table for all of us. And so we're doing these cases from the ground up. It's not like we're thinking about it theoretically. We, are, we have these cases where these kids, these women, et cetera, are saying, this is what it is. These gangs are really much bigger than just bad, you know, bad kids at the end of the block. They're really organized, basically semi-armies at this point that are coming after people who stand up to them. And so this is what it is. We actually have a case in the First Circuit involving a Salvadoran organizer who organized against them because he saw the gangs as a product of, of neoliberalism, of neoliberal policies, and he saw it as part of, 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 of something that he as a leftist needed to organize against. And so this is the case that's on the table. That's it. Um, yeah. yeah. With, with that, we're going to call Debbie. Up, oh, we have yes. <laughs> De Absolutely, say something. She's going to say the, cl the clinic ruined her life, but she wasn't in the clinic. I swear. Okay, but then I have to bend over. Okay. Can you hear? Is it echoing? Okay, so I would like to share my view, which I believe everyone in this room shares, and also many people who aren't here today. And that is, I want to express my heartfelt congratulations to Debbie, Nancy, and John for your tremendous contribution to both the, um, the development as well as the practice of asylum law 
and to your outstanding mentorship of so many wonderful students who have gone on to make their mark in the world. Thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you. I'm going to cry. <laughs> thank you. Anybody else? Maybe Huh? Right, right. Okay. Yeah, tell her the check is in the mail. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody else? I mean, Pam <laughs> started something here. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so what we're going to do, because it's getting late, is we're going to, we'd like Debbie to come up, because we always do everything together, and she's an incredible sister for us, and a mentor, and sometimes, no, 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 I'm not going to say the rest. <laughs> yeah. And we and yeah, so good. next, we'd like to start thanking people. So can you start? So I have to first thank, um, is Sabi out there? Yep. Get her in here. Get her in here. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to thank, I did it very quickly in this morning, but I have to thank everybody from our staff um, for amazing, incredible work. Um, and Savvy for her new work on refugee and law and trauma and going to be teaching a course and we're going to move in great directions. And Phil for his immigration work and Emily for everything and Palmer for not move, moving on to something great um, and helping me so much with the book this year. It's our last research fellow. Um, <laughs> it's a long story. And oh, come on up. Come on. Okay. And Emily, um, I guess I did Emily already. And I really want to give a special um, shout out to, uh, to Lucy Cummings, who, um, well, first of all, all of them made this go so seamlessly today. So. And Joe, I'm sorry. And Joe and Katkin and our core of interns and um, and to Lucy who just was an angel who came from heaven at the right moment and then we were we we're very smart people we know how to keep the best um, so she didn't abandon us despite coming to know us no so uh, <laughs> anyway thank you so much all of you for all your amazing work and all the work that the clinic's done. And thank you for just working so hard this last year to make this program uh, happen. Um, it's been an exhausting but rewarding, right? Rewarding? Yes. yes? <laughs> Say yes. <laughs> Say yes. Uh, <laughs> so I really. Okay, and um, okay, we haven't spoken much about Greater Boston Legal Services and the partnership that the clinic has with Greater Boston Legal Services. Um, and um, there are basically half the clinic is stationed over at Greater Boston Legal Services, and that's where John and I uh, put in our time. Um, and there are. Okay, I'm getting notes. Um, anyway, um, and there are a number of people here that I'd like to call up who are from GBLS, who um, work with students, mentor students, and um, who are very much a part of the clinic. So Jerry, would you come up? Anne? Okay, Jerry Tiesme, is he here? She's coming. She's coming. Well, then there's no and Sam Fox. Sam Fox. Summer Moore Estes. It's like winning the lottery. Uh, well, Palmer's, Palmer's already, already here. here. Palmer's already here. Um, Hillary Thrasher and Ben Pinnell. Could you guys come up and join us? Okay. I'd also like to thank all the students that are working with us this summer. We have a number of students on the other side of the river at GBLS, and I think there's some, there are how many students here? Three? Three. Three. So could you please stand up? Stand up, everybody, stand up, please. Okay, so now Debbie gets her floor again. Two cents in. 
Um, well, I, I, the last shout out, she'll have to put her camera down, is to Lori Rosenberg, who actually was the very beginning of this clinic, um, who first started supervising students at Cambridge and some of her legal services and, uh, um, and has, was the Justice Douglas of the Board of Immigration Appeals and uh, um, did a better job than Justice Douglas. <laughs> um, but in dissent, that was the point. Um, so, um, and uh, I wanted to um, make sure I have all my notes here. Wait a second. It's been a long day. It's been a long day. Um, where are I? Here we go. Um, and just one person who isn't here today, which is Sheila Murthy, who's been a supporter of Murthy Law Firm and was supposed to, to, uh, to chair the panel that I um, stepped in on. And she's been uh, a source of ongoing support for the clinic, and we really appreciate it enormously. Um, and I, I mentioned Judge Stahl already. <laughs> this is when things start getting disorganized. Um, so, um, and we also have a, um, a special uh, award here for, uh, for the Cleary Gottlieb Law Firm. Um, we've worked with a lot of law firms, but um, if, um, if um, Robert Clodiner was here. Hi. Only coincidentally did he graduate from here. We would have taken him anyway. <laughs> um, so nearly 20 years ago, um, Cleary alumni backed us up and created a summer fellowship for the clinic, which continues to this day. And that was a really incredible um, gift to us because things weren't, we didn't always have the same dean and things weren't always so, um, well institutionalized and supported here and knowing that it was of course the summer fellowship was very meaningful and we had a great student every summer but also the morale that that gave us um, was tremendous um, and they were really the first law firm to recognize us as the leaders we, we were and and have become in this field um, Additionally, Cleary has provided exceptional supervision to students working in our Iraqi Refugee Assistance Project for the last three years. HL, uh, HLS students in the IRAP pro program represent Iraqi refugees who have been wrongfully denied visas as refugees to come to the United States. Cleary continues to be a leader amongst law firms in pro bono representation. It has won an extraordinary quantity. It's amazing to Google the, them on the web, on, on the web, or Google them, right. <laughs> um, so extraordinary quality and variety of pro bono awards from prestigious nonprofit organizations and bar associations, and I could go on for hours listing their pro bono achievements, but to give you a flavor just in the past year, Best International Firm for Pro Bono Work at the Euromoney Legal Media Services Third Annual America's Women in Business Law Rewards. Recognized by the Southern Law Poverty Law Center for Outstanding Pro Bono Work in 2013. Honored at Sanctuary for Families 2013 Above and Beyond Pro Bono Achievement Awards. Pro Bono Partner of the Year by the Bronx Defenders. Recognized among, among Law 360's Pro Bono Firms of 2013, Human Rights, First, Human Rights First's Frankel Award. Um, so accepting today's award um, on behalf of Cleary is um, John Colliner. Do I have your name right? Close. Close. Yeah. Okay. Close Col Col Colliner, who is a partner in Cleary's litigation prop. Um, department. He's been a leader in public service in the legal field, and I'll just read you a little bit about his background. Um, for um, f he's been uh, he works in, in 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 criminal securities and other enforcement and agents and regulatory matters as well as. Um, as well as other matters before Cleary. He was a prosecutor with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York from 2000 and for 12 years, um, where he served in numerous leadership positions and, over, and 
and oversaw some of the most significant high pro profile investigations and prosecutions in the country. He's been prosecuting was white collar crime. You'll all be glad to know. And then we, uh, anyway, prior to that, um, he spent two years at the, as chief of the complex uh, frauds unit. In that capacity, he oversaw 20, 20 senior prosecutors investigating sophisticated, large scale, white collar. Um, did I say that wrong? Okay, white collar crimes, uh, ranging. What? Let me, um, let me yeah, you're going to stop. You don't want me to go on about you. But I. But we like the fact that you've been doing white crime collar work and fighting. We've. You've been fighting neoliberalism, as John would say. I've actually prosecuted people for taking advantage of of, uh, of immigrants. immigrants who were we like to get that. Naturalization. We like that. So here's our award. Thank you. To Cleary on the I feel like it's late for everybody. Yeah, really. Um, so I had some remarks, but in light of what Debbie just said, I think I'll maybe discretion is a better part of valor. And since I'm, I think, the one who's standing between you and cocktails. Um, so we, uh, this award means a lot to all of us, um, and to me personally, you know, um, uh, I'll just tell a brief personal story instead of what I was going to say. So my uh, grandparents actually were refugees themselves. Um, they uh, were Holocaust survivors, uh, and they lost their entire families. Both of them were married, had kids uh, in World War II, um, and, you know, they met in a displaced persons camp after the war. And my, grand, my father was born actually in Munich, so I'm actually a first generation myself. Um, and you know, they were lucky enough to have somebody here in the United States who helped them um, immigrate uh, to the United States. Uh, and you know, most people don't have that luxury. And you know, that's why the work that all of you do is so important and the work that, that why we're so proud at Cleary to help out. Um, you know, we value the relationship that we have with you. We think the work is incredibly important. Uh, we have uh, not just the fellowship, but most recently through the um, IRAP project. And you know, we, I think we've supervised, I think, 10, pro 10 cases maybe with Harvard Law students. Um, it's a great relationship. We look forward to continuing it over the next few years. Uh, and thank you all very much for this award. What? So go you all and get drunk, please. <laughs>